When I first started appearing in my videos, I didn't have a lot of cool stuff to surround myself with, meaning in the beginning, my set was pretty empty and boring. But since then, while on a trip to Colorado, I came across these three Malo posters at a local art store and just knew they'd be perfect to have behind me. Not only do they fit the general earth science vibe of the channel, but I also felt like I had earned this fruits one because I'd already made a few videos on fruits. And we all know I've talked enough about birds to justify having this one as well. Though that also means that despite being my personal favorite of the three, I didn't really have much of a justification behind buying this one. Besides, you know, it's pretty. I've never made a video even remotely about butterflies, mainly because, well, I don't actually know that much about butterflies. At first, this didn't really bother me, but as the months passed and I recorded more and more videos in front of these same three posters, I grew increasingly conscious of this gap in my knowledge. This only got worse after I convinced my girlfriend to lend me this, which I thought looked better hanging up behind me than it did hanging up in her childhood room of her parents' house. So now I have two different butterfly decorations on my set and still a total of zero actual understanding of them. I started to worry that someday someone would see all this and assume I knew even the tiniest bit about butterflies and try to start a conversation with me about them only to discover the truth. And I can't have my cover being blown like that. Remember, I need to be perceived as a knowledgeable person, so I can't have decorations on my set that have nothing to do with who I am or what I know. This gives me no choice. Either I admit to not actually knowing anything about these amazing creatures and to get rid of these things, or learn so much about butterflies that I feel justified in keeping them. Yeah, let's try that. Though I'll be honest, in a field like this where there are countless species, it's hard to know exactly where to start. Luckily, my girlfriend is aware of my fears, and so she found this for me at a local book sale. Kaufman Focus Guides on the Butterflies of North America. If you'll remember, I used a very similar book, uh, this one actually, to learn about the birds of Eastern and Central North America that have been driven to extinction. And that ended up being one of my favorite videos, not only because I think it turned out well, but also because I really enjoyed learning about the many amazing birds I never even knew used to live where I live. So now I'm thinking, what better way to learn about a whole new kind of animal than by doing the same exact thing and using this to find North America's missing butterflies. Butterflies. Okay, so bad news. I looked through this whole book and I couldn't find anything. Unlike this book where we can see here, the that's a Carolina parakeet, and then a few pages down. Here's the great auk. I hope you can see that, because I can't see the camera. And then there's the ivory-billed woodpecker. And then uh, the Labrador duck. They're all here, and each one gets a special inset so that you know they're extinct. But there's nothing like that in this book which can only mean one of two things. Either the author, this Ken Kaufman fellow, purposefully chose to exclude extinct animals from this book, or not a single butterfly species in the whole of North America has actually gone extinct. To figure out which it was, all I had to do was Google it. When you do this, immediately you'll find the same result over and over and over again. Stories about something called the Xerxes Blue. Just this name is enough for us to come back to this book, where we'll find blues to be an entire family of butterflies, along with other families like whites, sulfurs, coppers, and so on. The trend to pick up on here is that butterfly families are typically named based on their appearances. So whites are typically white, sulfurs are typically sulfuric yellow, coppers are like a bright orange, and so yeah, blues are blue. Though even within this family, there are still a number of genuses. Like here we can see these two are Averies, and then these two are 
Clock of Psyche. And then these are Leptodes. These are Brophidium. You get the idea. Even a single family of butterflies can still contain a huge diversity while all remaining blue. But I'll admit, even after double checking this entire section, I still couldn't find any entries or even just a picture of this Xerxes blue. Of course, that simply won't do. So I did a little bit more digging on the internet until I found this research paper from just a few years ago that explains some have questioned whether Xerxes blue was truly a distinct species or simply an isolated population of another living species. The living species in question is the silvery blue, a much more common butterfly that many thought the Xerxes resembled too much to be considered distinct from. And okay, if the Xerxes blue really was only a subspecies, I guess I can understand why it'd be left out of a book like this. After all, even this book left out the heath hen, an extinct subspecies of the greater prairie chicken. So maybe subspecies are just too much to include in field guides like these. But after analyzing the genome of a 93-year-old museum specimen, this study concluded that G. Xerxes was in fact a distinct species. Which means no excuses. It's definitely worth a mention in here. Though knowing this, let's go back and check out the silvery blue, the butterfly the Xerxes was long mistaken for, which we'll see... Aha, here. Sure enough, in its description, we'll find the extinct Xerxes blue was a close relative. And there you have it, the only mention of North America's sole extinct butterfly species anywhere in this book. No pictures, no description, just one brief sentence buried within the entry of another species. The only additional information we can glean from this comes from between these parentheses, which at least tells us the Xerxes' native range was in what's now San Francisco. While this isn't much to go on, I'll be honest, I've talked enough about extinct animals before to have a pretty good idea of where this story is going. These butterflies lived here, then humans arrived, disturbed their habitat by building a city, and all the butterflies disappeared. This is going to be a classic story of habitat destruction, isn't it? Well, it turns out, yeah, pretty much. The Xerxes Blue used to inhabit the coastal sand dunes that once covered the San Francisco Peninsula in what's now Northern California. Here they depended heavily on just a single plant, the Lotus scoparius, or deerweed, for its caterpillars to feed on. But once colonizers arrived and realized the strategic value of this peninsula as a port, quickly the coastal dune ecosystem was disturbed and eventually removed entirely, replaced with a new environment, a concrete jungle. And by 1943, a Xerxes blue was spotted fluttering around the Golden Gate National Park for the final time. It turns out butterflies, just like birds and really all wildlife, are equally vulnerable to the destructive forces of man. Who'd have known? What I'm more surprised by is the fact that this appears to be the only butterfly species across the whole continent that's met this unfortunate fate. I mean, don't get me wrong, San Francisco is a very developed city, but it's not like the only city in the whole of North America. What about New York, or Los Angeles, or Mexico City? You're telling me no butterflies were lost to make way for those urban areas? I mean, even the deer weed plant these butterflies once preferred hosted the larvae of several other butterflies, including the Ackman Blue, the Avalon Hair Streak, and the Funereal Dusky Wing, to name a few, but none of these died out when it disappeared. So what's going on here? What's the real story behind the Xerxes Blue? What other environmental or geographic factors might help explain why this and only this one species was driven all the way to extinction? I don't know about you, but that sounds worth investigating to me. Reading more of this study will find they offer a secondary cause behind their disappearance as its decline also coincided with the introduction of Lenophthema humuli, the Argentine ant, into the region, which may have contributed to species loss by outcompeting native ant species that tend and protect the caterpillars of G. Xerxes. And okay, this is also something we've heard of before, right? 
Invasive species are known for having unexpected consequences on completely unrelated animals. Though again, this really only helps to explain why Xerxes went extinct, and not why other butterfly species occupying similar niches didn't, despite being vulnerable to the same disturbances. Why did these ants help eradicate the Xerxes blue, but not even the Ackman blue, which also have mutualistic relationships with ants? Well, if you couldn't have guessed, the answer lies in geography. Before making this video, I was completely unaware of this, but it turns out California and the rest of Western North America is one of the greatest hotspots for butterfly biodiversity anywhere in the world. Though in my defense, maybe the reason I didn't know this is because it only really became apparent as a result of this study published in 2021. While we're not going to read the whole thing, its key findings were butterfly phylogenic diversity is highest in the warmest and wettest areas. Areas with historically stable temperatures have high relative phylogenic diversities, and the relationship of plant and butterfly relative phylogenic diversity is weak and spatially structured. What this all means is that butterflies prefer warm areas with stable climates and don't need a ton of different plants to diversify into different species, which just so happens to perfectly describe California, explaining why North American warm deserts have high endemism. Like this, we can see how the geography of the area has very directly influenced the biology therein. To really see what I mean, let's count up just the members of the blue family present here, starting with the western-tailed blue, the silvery blue, Anna's blue, the arrowhead blue, the marine blue, the western pygmy blue, the sonoran blue, the Ackman blue, the lupine blue, the veined blue, the San Miglio blue, the Serranus blue, Boy Duval's blue, the replenish blue, the Sierra Nevada blue, the mission blue, the Melissa blue, blue, the northern blue, the Shasta blue, spring azures, square spotted blues, dotted blues, small blues, Rita blues, Palos Verdes blues, and yeah, once upon a time, the Xerxes blue. Not only do we get a sense of how truly biodiverse this region is by doing this, but I also noticed two distinct distribution patterns among the populations here. For the most part, these blues have large ranges spanning multiple states and environments. However, there were a few species like the heather, the veined, the palos verdes, and san amigdio blues that each have much smaller, more restricted ranges. And based on its description, the Xerxes blue fell into this category too. When trying to find what these areas correlate to, it didn't take me long to recognize a pattern in where each of these lived. Veined blues keep to the Tejachapi Mountains. Palos Verdes blues only live in the Palos Verdes Mountains. San Amigdio blues prefer the San Amigdio Mountains. So, while California's general geography may have allowed numerous butterfly populations to thrive here, the geographic isolation of certain mountaintops have created ecological conditions more similar to islands, where any species that make it up here will be forced to adapt. This limits not only montane butterfly populations, but also their distribution, leading them to being far more vulnerable to disturbances as they only have a single habitat to fall back on. Put this all together and it's really no surprise that the arrival of humans threatened many of these isolated communities. Though fortunately, people don't really like living on the tops of mountains, which means most of these butterflies' primary habitats have actually remained remarkably well preserved. That is, except for the Xerxes blue, which also came about as the result of an isolated environment, the only difference being that it didn't live on a mountain, but rather within a very unique ecosystem located at the tip of a peninsula. So while isolation has produced a number of unique butterfly species throughout the region, only the Xerxes blue lacked the protection of being on a mountain. And so when this area was developed, all the other butterfly species that lived here, like the Ackman blue, the Avalon hairstreak, and Funereal dusky wing, they all also went locally extinct, just like the Xerxes, except they all had populations elsewhere to fall back on. 
allowing them to escape complete extinction, whereas the one and only environment the Xerxes relied on was now gone, leading to their ultimate demise. Like this, we can see how island biogeography has once again played a role in the loss of species. We'll even find confirmation of this by looking at Los Angeles, where we'll find not an extinct butterfly species, but one that was thought to be extinct. You see, on the outskirts of LA are the Palos Verdes Hills, where the Palos Verdes Blues fly. Very similar to the Xerxes, it calls only this single isolated environment its home. However, the hilly nature of the landscape here meant that while the San Francisco Peninsula became the center of a city, these hills remained on the periphery of LA and were only later developed into less dense residential neighborhoods. Even still, the construction of suburbs here led to a sharp decline in the Palos populations, reaching its lowest point in 1982, when the city bulldozed the last known expanse of their habitat to make way for a baseball field, leading many to assume they'd been driven extinct as well. But miraculously, in 1990, another small population was rediscovered tucked away in these hills, and since then, conservation and breeding efforts have allowed their numbers to recover slightly. Though with only a single known habitat remaining, the Palos Verdes Blue is still considered by many to be the rarest butterfly in the world. Like this, we can see the Xerxes Blue was by no means the only butterfly affected by human activities, but they just so happened to be the only species whose sole native environment was easy enough for us to completely remove, leaving it to this day as North America's only extinct butterfly species. Or at least that's what I thought until I found this copy of the Lepidopterist's News from 1956. You see, the whole time I was doing research for this video, everything I read told me the Xerxes Blue is the only one to have met this fate, except for this article on San Francisco's vanishing butterflies, where we'll read Xerxes was not alone among the peculiar butterflies of San Francisco. The first species to disappear was Minwa Stinnelli. Further down, we'll find another satyr, Minwa Berii, was the next to be lost. According to this, the Xerxes Blue wasn't the only species to have gone extinct in the area. But that's the problem. This article is the only place on the whole internet I found that mentions either of these two species. Trust me, googling them will bring you nothing, and going to the Wikipedia page for the entire Minwa genus will find shockingly little, only four members, none of which being the ones we're looking for. Now, after posting this video, things might change, but trust me, at the time of making this, there's nothing I could find anywhere on the internet about either of these two Minwa butterflies besides this one source. So what's going on here? The author of this article, this J.W. Tilden guy, sure seems to believe there are at least two other extinct North American butterfly species, and actually gives a pretty good explanation as to why no one else seems to have heard of them, as this species was lost so early and so rapidly that few specimens remain. The largest series was destroyed in the fire of 1906. The early stages were never recorded. Since it became extinct too early in the history of the area, almost anything that may be written concerning it is in the nature of conjecture. It is interesting to speculate on why it became extinct so rapidly, since it was at one time considered common. It disappeared, oddly enough, while there was still a good deal of unsettled land in the city. Though after reading that, I only have more questions. While this might help explain why so little is known about these two butterflies, it doesn't explain why literally no one else appears to even be aware of them. I mean, Tilden himself wrote a few specimens remain, implying at least some evidence of their existence still exists. And yet, 70 years after this was first written, they've all but vanished, not only from the Earth, but from our collective knowledge as well, forcing me to ask, have these two butterfly species truly been forgotten? Taking another look at the Minwa genus, only one of these even has a Wikipedia page of its own. Though here we'll learn the Minwa Dryas's range stretches from southern and central Europe up to Central Asia and Japan, otherwise known as nowhere even remotely close to the area we're focusing on. 
Checking the other three Minwa butterflies will find the same thing. Minwa orata, Minwa nagasawe, and Minwa papura all have ranges strictly within Asia. This only makes things more confusing. I mean, why would there be two small populations of Minwa butterflies thousands of miles away from their closest relatives? Clearly something's not right here, so now what I have to do is get to the bottom of these two missing butterflies. And I think the best place to start is with this J.W. Tilden guy. Typing his name into Google will find that whoever this guy was, he was super into lepidopterology, as 30 years after writing this article, he'd go on to publish a whole book of his own about California's butterflies. And considering Tilden appears to be the only person even aware of these American Minwa species, I figure his book represents my best chances of finding any more information on these two elusive butterflies. So I bought a copy. But before we dive in, I want to tell you my expectations. First off, I'm really hoping there's more than eight words dedicated to the Xerxes blue in here. I mean, this guy wrote a whole article about them, so I can only imagine he'd have more to say about them than Ken Kaufman did. I also want a picture of them, something this book failed to provide. As for the two missing Minwa species, I really hope they're in here, but I'm not feeling confident about it. I guess there's only one way to find out. Okay, this is kind of unrelated, but check this out. On the very first page, we can see some guy named Jeffrey from Austin, Texas must have ordered this book originally. And then if we flip over to the title page, we'll find a handwritten note and it reads, best regards to Jeff from J.W. Tilden, signed September 30th, 1987. This is an autograph, and better than that, we get to see what Tilden's funny little handwriting looked like. Anyway, let's start flipping through this and see if we can find what we're looking for. Okay, so I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is there are no pictures anywhere in this book. <laughs> but the good news is here on page... 150, I just lost it, 150, we'll find an entry for the, hang on, what page, this page? We'll find an entry for the Xerxes Blue. By now, we already know everything that's written here, so I won't bore you all by repeating myself, but it's just good to see an extinct animal receiving its own description in a book like this. Actually, I was wrong. Look, here we can see it says plate 17N. I hope you can see that. 17N, which means we should be able to find all the way in the back, all the way in the back. Oh, yes, here we go, come on. All the way in the back, pictures. And even better than that, we can go to, okay, here it is, 17 in. Can you see that? It's this page. And if we look for it uh, in here, that's weird. Oh, okay, okay, so here we go. Oh, this thing's cut off. Uh, here, oh, God, can you see it? I gotta stand up. Here we can see seven. We're on plate 17 and this is in. So this must be what the female Xerxes look like. And then I think this must be what the male Xerxes is. Why having a picture of these creatures matters so much is because imagine if you by chance happened to come across the last Xerxes blue living in the wild. You'd probably think to yourself, wow, I've never seen this butterfly before. Let me look it up in here. Without an entry or even just a picture of its own, there's no way you'd be able to identify it, and you'd probably end up assuming you'd seen a more common blue. If all you had was this book, you'd never even know you'd rediscovered an entire species, and by extension, no action to protect those that remain could be taken. Like this, we can see excluding extinct animals from books like these can actually contribute to their extinction. So kudos to Tilden for including them in here, as it shows he really wanted people to be aware of and continue looking for Xerxes, something I can't say about Kaufman. But okay, now it's time to look for the other two Minwa butterflies. 
So I flipped through this whole thing and unsurprisingly, I couldn't find any mention of either of these in here. So what's happening here? Could even Tilden have forgotten about them? Well, in his original article, he described these both as satyrs. And if we go to the index, we'll see satyrs are on page 68. Double checking this whole section, still no minois, but here on page, here on page 69, we'll find something called Riding's Seder, whose taxonomic name is neo Minois Riding's Eye. And this got me excited because oftentimes species from the Americas receive the prefix neo to indicate they're from the New World. So it's perfectly possible that they were reclassified as New World Minois after people realized they were distinct from their Asian relatives. Looking it up, wow, that's one empty Wikipedia page. But even still, there are precisely two members of the neo minois genus, which at first appears promising, except neither of the species names match with what we're searching for, which is kind of weird. Even weirder, going back to this book, we'll find Riding's Seder has a range nowhere even close to San Francisco, and Wikipedia tells me the other neo minois lives even further away, across northeastern Mexico, so I'm not really sure if this is the genus we're looking for or not. But if we keep reading, we'll find another potential lead, the Stenely Seder. Stenely being the species name for one of our missing Minois. Sure enough, we'll find it in this book under the name the Great Basin Wood Nymph, with the range falling mostly within the Great Basin, of course, but does reach to the Californian coast, making this already look a lot more promising. Then going back and checking what Tilden had to say, we'll see the very last word on this page is three, and then California subspecies. So three California subspecies, and the first one is Stenely Sater, C.S. Stenely, formerly found on the San Francisco Peninsula, now extinct. This can't be a coincidence. I'm gonna go ahead and say mystery solved. This must be what Tilden once referred to as Minois Stenely. However, checking the Wikipedia page for the Great Basin Wood Nymph, we'll find only two recognized subspecies, with the one we're looking for, of course, being the one that's missing. Trying to make sense of this eventually led me to the Integrated Taxonomic Information System, where I looked up Circeonus Stenely and found a total of seven subspecies, including not only C. S. Stenely, but also one named C. S. Berii. Which means I think I did it. I think I located both of these missing butterflies. Like this, we can see how the changing of names and classifications has made these extinct animals extremely difficult to track down, to the point where they've almost been completely forgotten about. So now I gotta ask, why do we keep changing things? Well, if we look back to the index of this book, we'll find an entire chapter dedicated to butterfly name changes. I guess this sort of thing happens a lot. Flipping to page 62, we'll read, Those who return to the study of butterflies after a lapse of some years are surprised to discover that while they remember the butterflies themselves well enough, many of the names have changed beyond recognition. Scientific names are changed not capriciously, but in accordance with rules set down by a worldwide organization of zoologists, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. And okay, it's all starting to make sense now. These butterflies must have been mistaken as their very own species when they were first discovered. But as more and more of these kinds of butterflies were found in surrounding areas, eventually people came to realize they were all part of a single species and had their taxonomic names changed accordingly, with Minois Thinnily becoming C.S. Thinnily and Minois Berii most likely becoming C.S. Berii. On the next page, Tilden concludes this section by writing, So to all of our readers who take up the study of butterflies anew, don't be discouraged by name changes, which are bound to continue. Instead, look for the reasons behind these changes. If you do so, you will find the study of butterfly names a fascinating subject in itself, and an interesting aspect of natural history. And <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. What we can see happening here is the confusing genetics of butterflies paired with a less than perfect taxonomic system has made it nearly impossible to keep track of all the many subspecies and distinguish them from true species. 
Why this matters is because if you'll remember, the Xerxes blue was also once considered to be only a subspecies, and it was only after we drove it extinct that we realized our mistake. And given the sheer biodiversity of this area, what this means is that there could very well be entire species on the brink or already extinct that nobody cares or even knows about simply because it's assumed to be just another subspecies. Luckily, there are still people out there like J.W. Tilden who recognize the value of all living things. Because at the end of the day, who cares about exactly how genetically distinct each of these are? The loss of an entire population of animals is still just that. A loss. A sentiment clearly expressed by Tilden all the way back in 1956, where he concludes this article by writing, The history of San Francisco's butterflies is obviously incomplete. It is hoped that other observers will be stimulated to add their information to the knowledge of this interesting matter. And I love that last part because that's exactly what I'm doing with this video. I've fallen right into your trap, Tilden. It's my hope that by looking at these lost, forgotten, and extinct animals that not only will they become more well known, but also help convince people that those remaining butterfly species and subspecies deserve protection so that we can one day get this mess all sorted out. And if I can accomplish this, then, well, I think I earned the right to have these butterflies up behind me. If you'd like to continue learning with me, you're in luck, as I just finished a video for my new channel, Astro Pro. If you didn't know, a few months ago I entered into a contest to officially name one of 20 exoplanets, and in just a few weeks they'll be releasing the results. In anticipation of this, I thought let's explore every last one of these places and see what exactly it is that makes them worthy of receiving names. While this video won't be coming out on YouTube for another few days, it's up on Nebula right now. This is where you get early access to videos from both Atlas and Astro Pro, as well as all your favorite other YouTubers days, sometimes weeks before they're up everywhere else. Plus, there's loads of original content here, like the show Extremities, that'll take you to some of the most remote places on the planet and see what life is like in these isolated communities. And if you use the link in the description, you can get all of this for Nebula's lowest price ever, of just $2.50 a month, or $30 for a whole year as well as free access to Nebula's classes. Here you can learn the skills to become a creator directly from the creators who may have inspired you in the first place. So if you want to make videos like mine, you can take a class on how to go viral with maps from the legend himself, Joe of Real Life Lore, or how to use animation to make your videos next level, or even how to just be yourself on camera, something I'm still working on myself. Not only will signing up get you early access to my videos, originals, classes, podcasts, and more, all completely ad-free, but you'll also be helping to support me and really the whole educational YouTube community in the process. So once again, make sure to use the link in the description to take advantage of this deal and check out my latest Astro Pro video. And that's about it for this video. Let me know if you all enjoyed learning about butterflies, and if this is something you'd like to see me continue looking into by leaving a like. And of course, subscribe if you're not already to make sure you don't miss out on what's coming next. Lastly, I'd like to thank my patrons who continue to support me and this channel. You guys are the ones that made this all possible, and I hope to see you all with another video soon. Thanks.